and in the second lecture uh, we're going to start or the real first uh, lecture of the course because before we just had an, an introduction uh, we'll uh, start uh, uh, seeing the first features uh, of the javascript language okay uh, so this for today we are dealing with the basics uh, the, 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 the really basic points of the language uh, I reported here some cheat sheets, cheat sheets uh, sorry, that uh, can, can be useful to, to have a, a burst view, um, a burst eye view of, of the main functions. There are several of them uh, in the internet, so I just select a couple of them just to have something with colors uh, to put in the slides. Our goal here, as I mentioned, was not to learn how to script our page, but to learn a language. So let, we will do the first step. Uh, to uh, JavaScript as a language, and uh, um, especially uh, we are targeting the modern features of JavaScript. So JavaScript, we see a bit of history, just the actually uh, as a, a very strange and complex history, and um, it, it contains very obsolete constructs and very modern constructs uh, at the same time. Uh, basically will be aligned uh, to what is called the uh, ES6, uh, the, uh, the, the version that was standardized in 2015 and was implemented a couple of years later uh, with some constructs of ES7 that can be useful. Uh, and uh, these versions are um, universally supported by the Node runtime environment and by all the recent browsers. Uh, um, we don't want to push too, too forward the, the, the level of the language to avoid the compatibility problems with the browsers. Uh, so some, some first uh, introduction about the language and then we'll go into its structure. Uh, basically, this uh, statistic uh, published by GitHub shows that in the last, uh, well, what's that, uh, six or seven years, uh, JavaScript has consistently been the most popular language uh, uh, that dominated, uh, say, at least in the in the GitHub uh, universe. Okay, so that's uh, the most popular one. You see that the others are Python, which is increasingly popular step by step. It overcame Java. We have a TypeScript, uh, which is growing very, very fast. This is a version of JavaScript with with a, a type annotation, so a typed version of JavaScript you know, of the same family, and then the other languages. Uh, uh, that are stable or, or going uh, low in their popularity. Mm -hmm. So we are targeting uh, one of the top uh, uh, languages uh, in the world. And uh, the, what is surprising is that the first version of JavaScript was written by Brandon Hike in just uh, 10 days of work. Okay, the, at, the, at the moment people were working at the version two of the Netscape Navigator, mm -hmm. something that you don't remember. Uh, and they wanted to add some animation into the web pages, so they had to come up with the, some scripting language. And this person just put together uh, something very quickly, an interpreter for that uh, in, in 10 days, and they shipped that into the browser. That action set in motion a set of big events uh, where uh, they could not step back anymore, and uh, it could only increase in complexity and increase in functionality. Mm -hmm. Um, right now is, a, is an officially recognized uh, programming language uh, that normally runs uh, into a browser, but can also run on a server. Hmm? Uh, let's say on a computer, or on a server, or on a, on a virtual machine. So, uh, thanks to an interpreter called Node.js that was a porting of the JavaScript engine from Chrome into an independent executable. Uh, by stripping away all the parts related to the browser and just keeping the language interpreter and adding some API to the um, operating system. Uh, right now, there's a project called Dino also, which is the inverse of Node. Uh, that also should be a, a lighter, simpler version of, uh, of Node, let's say, with a more limited functionality, more target for embedded systems. So JavaScript will also be moving to more constrained environments if you want. Uh, apart from the name, it has nothing to do with Java, and we'll discover that um, it has very different assumptions about the language and the, uh, the semantics of the of the language structure compared to Java. Uh, I installed this uh, uh, slide uh, about the history of, uh, of JavaScript just to see that the language was initially you know, uh, designed by Brandon Hyde, as I said, beginning uh, in 1995. 
um, and it evolved uh, uh, through uh, at a given point they came to a um, standardization committee which is called the ECMA script uh, um, committee uh, ECMA is the name of the standardization committee is a, is a Swiss organization that uh, manages standards uh, and they got took the name of the committee ECMA and script from JavaScript and they called the new language the new standard language ECMAScript. Mm, everybody still calls it uh, JavaScript even if the official name is ECMAScript but that's why you, you see the language called as ES5, ES6, ES7, and not JS5, JS6, JS7. Okay, ES6 refers to the sixth version of the ECMAScript standardization of the language that was published in 2015. Uh, people also call it ES2015. So you can refer by the version number or by the year number. Uh, the two are easy to, to compute because there is a new version every year. So ES7 is from 2016, ES8 from 17, ES9 from uh, 2018, and so on. Okay, uh, and uh, each each new version adds new features to the language and, and adds new modules to the to the standard library. So every year you have a new standard version of the library. Of course, it doesn't mean that all the features will be immediately implemented in Node.js. Uh, or it will be immediately implemented in the browsers, in all the browsers. Okay, they will, it will take time. Maybe some browsers are also able to implement some feature in advance with respect to the standard, because uh, uh, for you know, competing with each other. And some will be slow, more slower, and some feature will be more complex to implement, so they will take more time and so on. So uh, there's a difference between what the standard says and what levels of standard you are targeting and what the browsers are implementing. Um, the bigger step uh, in, in the language uh, came uh, at the stage at the time of EX5 and 6, basically. So at this time here, you see that there is from 1999 to 2009. So 10 years passed. There was a big stagnancy about uh, uh, the type of language that was uh, uh, you know, used in the early 20s. Uh, that was the level ECMAS 3, ES3, JavaScript 3. Um, that, uh, and it, it took 10 years to get to a new version of the standard where it was really a revolution of the language. It's not a new language, but it was a refoundation of the language on much stronger basis that were uh, necessary for supporting larger applications. You know? So they tried to also took away some concept of the language that was problematic from the, from the compiler point of view uh, and so on. And so uh, ES5 uh, uh, was the real revolution and ES6 just added some syntax uh, like classes and modules that make some, some, some feature more easy to use. Uh, um, but these are, are the, the big change and so we will position ourselves after this big switch after this big change and what is called the modern JavaScript starts here after this uh, big switch. Um, and of course uh, from the moment every year the committee uh, the ECMAScript committee will uh, release a new version uh, and this committee today is involved uh, with uh, uh, the guys from the low, uh, from the top level tech, tech companies, because having your favorite feature in the language or in the library will, of course, make a difference uh, in your success in the success of your applications in the market. Okay, so you see the big names here that contribute to development or to steering the development of JavaScript. If you want, you can download all the versions uh, of JavaScript uh, or, sorry, ECMAScript uh, or whatever uh, in from the um, from the website uh, from the ECMA two two six two uh, web page here. Uh, you can do that, but you will find them highly unreadable. They are extremely formal, technical. They are more for the developer of compilers rather than the programmer of JavaScript. So that's not uh, very useful. And that's the, that's the specification of the language. Of course, the language must be implemented. And there were several, and there are several implementations of the language. 
Uh, notably, um, the, there's one implementation of, uh, of the JavaScript language in with the V8 engine, which is used nowadays in Chrome and also Edge, of course, which is derived from Chrome uh, and Node.js. There's another implementation by the Mozilla Foundation, which is called Spider Monkey. And, uh, and there's the JavaScript core uh, engine, which is used by Apple inside Safari. Basically, these are the ones. The, the Microsoft implementation basically was dismissed when Edge was moving from a, a, you know, a, a, cost, a Microsoft product into a new, let's say, um, visual aspect from, from Google Chrome. So right now, Edge uses the Chrome uh, engine inside it. There are different interpreters, so they may have different levels of implementation, different quirks with different uh, strange behaviors. And so that's why in the Mozilla Developer Network, in the MDN page, so remember Mozilla Developers Networks is our source of information. For every language feature, you have a table like that that will tell us maybe the different methods or the different pro property of the objects, how they are implemented in the different browsers uh, desktop browsers, mobile browsers, and in this picture it was cut also in Node, uh, there will be also in many cases a Node uh, JS uh, column. And we'll tell you that uh, this feature is not supported by this browser, for example, or is supported by this browser starting from version 46 and so on. So that you have some uh, compatibility metrics that will tell you whether the feature that you're going to use will create any problems if you are trying to publish it on the wild uh, and uh, understand whether your users will be will find problems or not. And you see that there's not a clear line. Hmm? Uh, the features are implemented by the different uh, uh, browser vendors at different times. So uh, the numbers uh, mean the versions of the, um, of the tool. So 46 means version 46 of Opera and the Chrome uh, 59 means phone version 59 uh, uh, on uh, for higher numbers. The minimum, the minimum number of, of version number to support the feature. Um, so if you don't, usually we don't have the two total full knowledge of which versions my customers are using, uh, and so we can decide whether to use a function or not. Uh, even because next month uh, everything will change, will evolve. Huh? So we should know that some features are safe to use everywhere and some feature may be unsafe. So we may need some kind of mechanism of dealing with the compatibility of the evolution of the language. So the design of the JavaScript language is strange. They decided the language to be so-called backwards compatible. It means that um, uh, read this, uh, let's read this sentence. Once something is accepted as valid JavaScript, okay, if something I write today in JavaScript is valid, there will not be a future change to the language that causes that code to become invalid. So if I'm writing something in JavaScript today, it will run later on in 10 years. Okay, So that is why we can go today to very old websites and our browsers still are able to run the JavaScript code there. But it's not forward compatible. It means that if I have a website that uses a more modern construct, language construct, it will not run in an older JavaScript engine. So if I'm visiting a website with an old browser, <clears throat> the code may not run in the old browser. Um, okay. And if you think uh, HTML is if, uh, is the reverse, if if you are visiting a, a a new page with an old browser, the new elements in HTML are just simply ignored. Okay, the HTML browser, the HTML engine just uh, forgets about the elements that it doesn't know. So it's very easy to extend the language and don't break uh, all the. Um, uh, the idea for, for the designers of HTML was uh, we don't want to um, force you to change your browser. And uh, in the, the JavaScript community, the idea is the reverse. We don't want you to lose access to all the websites, but you should update uh, your browser to keep up with the development of the language. And so what it means is that uh, uh, 
what that what does older mean one year six months three days it depends on the feature of the language that i'm using okay uh, so there are mechanisms right, for dealing with this compatibility some mechanisms are already inside the language for example there is a keyword strict mode that we will use that will set the language that it will declare that the language is at least es5 okay it's at least modern you see that in es5 here we mentioned that it introduced the strict mode where is that sorry i lost the mouse okay strict mode here uh, meaning that uh, uh, we can at least say whether the code is compliant to the old or to the modern version of JavaScript. Um, and so in this case, we will only work, we are all today, we are only interested to work uh, in strict mode JavaScript, at least in this course. Okay. Uh, and then there are mechanisms uh, for uh, allowing a browser that reads a version of JavaScript newer that the browser is able to support to be able to interpret that, that version in two ways. Hmm? Uh, one is called the transpiling. Actually, what happens is that when you write your JavaScript using the latest features, before giving the JavaScript to the browser, the JavaScript gets translated into a simpler version. So they retranslate your code using language constructs that were compatible with your um, with your browser and if you don't know which is your browser you can instruct this transpiler it's called the most famous one is called babel uh, like the tower of babel okay that tries to reconcile the across different languages um, the the minimum versions that you want to support and so it will create a transpiled version that is actually many different versions that fit the different kind of browsers that you may have of course it's a complex process is a time consuming process but you only do once before sh before shipping the product it converts newer javascript syntax that could cause a, just a syntax errors in the in the in the older browsers into older syntaxes that are equivalent or nearly equivalent okay and the other technique is called the polyfilling so uh, maybe we are using a syntax which was already valid but you are using a function of the library function that now it takes three parameters and before it only took two because they added a new one right now or a library function that was not available before so what can we do here we can provide a new uh, the way of filling the holes in the standard libraries it's called polyfilling this technique or filling the missing holes uh, the, the modern methods and functions that you are calling that were not defined in the older browsers and javascript allows a very dynamic redefinition of the property of an object so this is easy to do so not easy to do it's possible to do it's very complex because there are a lot of incompatibilities that you need to deal with usually these mechanisms are transparent for us we use them as part of the of the build process of an application that will call the transpiler or the in, include the polyfill library that will just do the translation for us this means that we can be quite sure that we can work with a modern version of the language and can support some older browser in the past of course the more distant is the version that we are using compared to the browser that we are that the users are, are, um, are adopting the more work these trans translations will have to do and the closer, of course, uh, the, the, uh, le the less work we have to translate and uh, the less complexity we have in our application. But at least we have these mechanisms for dealing with, in a flexible way, with the different uh, speeds of development uh, of the different language features. Mm -hmm. um, transpiling uh, is uh, compiling from a language to the same language. So a compiler compiles from a high level language to a low level language, right? A transpiler compiles from JavaScript to JavaScript, except that the target language is an older version of JavaScript. So if you have something that uses a new syntax, you can compile a new program also in JavaScript that uses an old syntax for doing the same thing. Okay, this, this name is strange because you are not compiling to a lower level representation, but you are transpiling to a sem the same level language with the different features. 
Um, is the transpiler able to go back to another version? Do we have to provide the equivalent code? No, the, uh, the library of the transpiler already knows uh, the conversions. Okay, so it's uh, they, somebody already did the work for us. Okay, we don't have to care about that. We, not, we need to be aware of that, especially when we go to React, we see that during the build process it calls Babel. And uh, at the beginning, it said, right, be, be aware that we are now transpiling in the browser, but before, before uh, publishing, of course, you need to transpile in the server to avoid extra costs, extra computational costs. So this step that we need to be aware of, but in most of the cases, it's transparent for us. Okay, We know it's there. We know it's going its work. In the Babel configuration, you just set the minimum versions of the browsers that you want to support in the, in the, in the past, and the library knows which kind of uh, transformation to apply. Uh, it's a very wild word out there in JavaScript. Okay, so if we stick to, let's say, more or less uh, modern JavaScript, uh, what are the execution environments that we are considering? Uh, the language is the same, JavaScript. Let's fix on ES6 or ES7 if you want. You can run them in a server or in a command line. So I'm saying server or command line is the same, like okay, in a, in a command window or in a daemon somewhere. And usually um, we use the Node.js uh, uh, tool uh, for transpiling. Uh, sorry for transpiling. For, I, I was taken away from the, by the question for for executing this code. So Node.js is a compiler and interpreter of JavaScript code. Uh, People say that JavaScript is an interpreted language. It may have been true in the past, but today it's not. Okay, JavaScript has a compilation uh, step and then an execution step. So it's compiled to an intermediate code like all the modern language. There's no real line by line interpretation. So it's correct to call it a compiler and interpreter of the language. And uh, we have the link here for both. Uh, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Windows, uh, on Mac, uh, on. Uh, and I like to work uh, on Windows with the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, like the virtual machine provided by Microsoft itself, uh, which are very um, easy to work with. Uh, you don't need to install a lot of stuff, and you already have a, a ready Linux machine uh, on your computer. But it's just a matter of preference. Um, JavaScript may run in the browser. And basically, every browser has embedded a JavaScript runtime inside as part of the browser. And it gives you some developer tools uh, so that you can go and inspect uh, what the browser is doing at the moment. So right now, we don't have a, a nice web pages to see. But if you go to the this is Firefox, for example, if you go to the web developer uh, tools, so you have, uh, uh, you can see the JavaScript code that is running in the page. I don't know what is in this page in particular, uh, but uh, usually there's a lot of code running and you can see that and you can debug it. So inside every browser, we have a, um, a JavaScript debugger and the JavaScript inspector. And we you use it a lot when, you are, when we are going to, to develop uh, our code and to debug it. Um, and uh, uh, so these are part of the browsers and there are also some tools uh, that will help us to understand what is happening especially at the first step when you when we are learning how the language works uh, um, we we can for example go to the this uh, python tutor the, sorry, the javascript tutor which is on at this website which is called python tutor where you can write some javascript code and see the graphical representation of the variables. And we'll use that uh, to understand the variable model that in JavaScript is quite different from, from what we are accustomed in Java or in C. It's much more similar, somewhat more similar to Python as a, as a language structure rather than the other languages. Um, for the question that we have, I have in chat, uh, Gabbing is asked, uh, why do we have to transpile? Uh, we transpile if uh, we want our code to run on a browser that doesn't support the syntax we are using today. So I want to run the browser around the code on a browser that supports an older syntax. And so I need to rewrite my code using that older syntax. Usually, as I said, is a process that is part of the build and compilation steps. So it's quite transparent for us 
except for the time that it takes. Uh, Roberto is asking if Node is equivalent to GCC. Uh, no, not, uh, not really, because Node contains the compiler and the execution and the interpreter. So in GCC, uh, you compile the code and you get an executable, a binary executable. In Node, the compilation is done inside and then it will start executing the, the, the code itself. So it's more of an interpreter rather than a compiler. But now we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll open it. Hmm? Okay, so let's uh, let's start uh, at uh, having a look uh, at the structure of the language. Uh, JavaScript uh, is a language when we have uh, one program per file. Hmm? Uh, there are extensions that are called modules that come much later. Okay, they came also historically much much later. Uh, but the, um, the, the model of execution or compilation of the program is that you have one big file and everything is in there. Okay, each, each file is independent from the other, so there's no problem of sharing or, or uh, uh, having different variables in different files. Hmm. Um, there is, of course, a way of making different uh, programs communicate with each other but this is done through the external environment and not inside the programs let's not go into details about this right now because we don't need it yet uh, we'll try to understand it more when we discuss the modules uh, next week basically the file is read from top to bottom so you read the first line until the the last one you pass the file and then you start executing it so if you have a syntax error in the last line, the program will not execute, not even from the first one. Okay, so it needs to be compiled all first and then will be executed. And uh, the JavaScript environment uh, contains already a standard library where many, uh, many functions, many APIs are already available. So there's a really uh, uh, large libraries which are available and provided by the execution environment. By the way, execution environments are different. So the standard libraries that provide the API, the programming interface that provides the browsers is different from the API that is provided by Node, for example, because the environment is different. So both are very large. They have a part in common, which is a JavaScript standard library, and they have additions that are the browser library or the Node library. And they all are available to our programs. Uh, from the syntax, uh, JavaScript uh, superficially looks like uh, C or C plus plus or Java. So it takes it uses semicolons and braces uh, for for blocks. So blocks. So use braces for blocks. Uh, use uh, C like comments uh, like. Uh, slash asterisk and the double slash in C++. Uh, so the, 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 the lexical structure is uh, uh, similar. One point which is a bit controversial are semicolons, uh, which in JavaScript are optional. Optional means that uh, if the interpreter doesn't pass correct an instruction, it tries to insert a, a semicolon and see whether it works. So in many cases, if you forget a, a semicolon, the compiler is able to insert it uh, by itself and go on. In some cases, it might insert it in the wrong place or it might uh, consider correctly something that should have been uh, two different statements. We see some examples later. My suggestion is uh, let's put them hmm, uh, just for, for, for order. But, there are um, a lot of programmers that they're really okay. So if the language is inserting semicolons for me, why should I do the work for it? Mm -hmm. And so they try to, to remove them and not use them anyway. So it's a bit of controversial debate, but uh, um, the idea is that uh, the compiler in many cases is able to, um, to deduce where the semicolon should be, except when the next line starts with a character like an open square or a round bracket uh, that could look like a function call or an array access of the value of the expression of the previous line. So in these cases, if you have a line that starts with these characters and you don't have the semicolon, then you may, you may get a syntax error because the interpreter tries to merge two statements. 
I don't want to be in the hands of the compiler, so I personally prefer to add the semicolons if I don't forget them. Um, first of all, we decided that we want to explore the modern JavaScript, so we start with strict mod, and it means that every file always starts with a directive, which is written like this. If the first line of your file is a use strict semicolon, then the um, interpreter switches to strict mode and it starts to uh, consider JavaScript in the strict mode language. Okay, uh, there are a few a few differences. Um, we'll, we'll, I, I will mention them when we go uh, into the, that part. Uh, but for us, it will be the default. Okay, uh, we will always write code in uh, strict mode. So let's try to remember to put this uh, statement at the beginning of your files. There are exceptions in which uh, uh, strict mode is, uh, is enabled by default. For example, in the modules, when you are importing a module, but for the moment, uh, uh, let's remember that we want to use the modern version of the language. Okay, let's go to, to the language itself. And maybe let's try to make it less boring by trying to write some code while uh, at the same time, while we are, or, well, we are uh, seeing the slides, okay? Uh, so let me open and a new folder, application one. What is that? Okay, 2021. Uh, we already have something. Make, make directory. Chase basics. Okay, I created directory Chase basics here. And I open my Visual Studio into this folder. Okay. Okay. So I have this folder. The Visual Studio doesn't really have the notion of projects, but just of folders that contain information. And in this folder, I can create a, a new files with this icon here, new file. So I can create, uh, like now, for example, we are setting values and types. Uh, uh, let's call it values. Yes. So we have this editor where we can write the code. Uh, we can execute the code in, in different ways. OK, so let's first uh, have a look here. Uh, the JavaScript has some primitive types, uh, which may be strings numbers, boolean, or some special types, and some complex types. Strings are now easy to represent. They can be represented with double quotes or single quotes, or back quotes, and that's a special type of string, can be interpolated. We'll see that later. There's only one type number that covers both integers and a floating point. They are all of the same type. There's one boolean type, of course, with two only two values, uh, true and false, with a lowercase t and lowercase f, uh, di different from Python, for example. And then there are these two strange types that are called null and undefined. Hmm? They are not just values, but they are, they are types of variables that may have a, a value. The strange thing about uh, JavaScript, uh, and it's familiar if you're coming from Python, for example, is that variables don't have any type. Values do have types so if i have a variable a um, you cannot ask the question what is the type of this variable you can only ask uh, what is the type of the value represented by this variable hmm? it means that uh, uh, a variable is just a reference to a value somewhere a value is strongly typed every value is a, is a type and there's a set of operations that you can do on that type. The variable doesn't know any of it, just know how to refer to the value. So for example, if I write a equal to ABC, I, in my mind, I represent it as a variable A linking to a string that contains the value ABC. A doesn't have a string. A is a, is a pure reference that refers to an object. 
this object is a string it has a type okay so i can write a equal to three immediately after and so i will have another object which will be a number that contains three and from that moment a will point there and of course we will forget the old value a there's no problem here because variables are pure references they don't have a type they can refer to objects and every object knows their own type you know it's different in java the variable knows the type of the object that is being pointed to here the variable doesn't know but the object knows itself by itself okay um and how can we execute this for you if I, for example if i wanted to write this instruction i could write the code here so let's first let's say use strict hmm. i could uh, uh, declare a variable let's call it uh, uh sorry let's, let's keep a, a couple of slides and then we go back uh we can I will, uh, so if we if i don't have a type how can i declare a variable i can declare a variable with two different keywords okay there are three let's talk about two of them let and const let it creates a variable and const it creates a const var is the old way of declaring variables uh, which is still supported, but is the old uh, syntax, let's say, supported in the previous versions of, of JavaScript. Uh, for the moment, let's uh, uh, study let and const, which are easier to understand, and then we understand the, how var is working, which is a bit uh, not very intuitive. So creating a variable just means having uh, using let a equal to abc, for example. Now I have declare the variable let a and I assign this variable to a value in this case a string value now I can run it how can I run it oh, I can for example open here a terminal in the same directory and use the command node and the file name values and I'm running the code. Of course, I don't see anything because I just assigned a variable. Maybe I want to print the value of this variable to see something. And printing is done in JavaScript with the console object that has a console is like system.out in Java, dot uh, log a. Okay, console.log is a print on the standard output and so if i execute this program again i see that the program is printing abc so basically this is just a, a terminal so i run the command from the terminal line if i want to run it into the interpreter i could i can do that of course in a, um, in visual studio code by using the, the run menu for example run without debugging and it will ask me, so I went to run here, and it will ask me what engine do I want to run it on? Because this is a JavaScript file. What is the, the execution engine that you want? Node. So I choose node here. And it will take some time to load node. At the end, it will print the same text here but to avoid doing this uh, every time what we could do is to go to it's a bit boring at the beginning you go to the run menu here and you create a a, um, a new launch launch configuration you can create a new configuration for this file running on node.js so every launch configuration in Visual Studio Code is just a, a configuration, some lines into a file called launch.json. Launch that says that we have a configuration called launch program that will run the file called values.js. 
maybe I can customize the name uh, values example. I save this file and you see here in the run drop down the name of all the configurations that have been set. So once I configure in, in the same folder one or many run configuration so I can also configure more if I have another file uh, I can select what I want to do and then run directly here and it prints here of course uh, by default this will start also the debugger so if I set a breakpoint here I can run the code and the execution will stop uh, at the breakpoint and at that point i can see all the variables here and you can see where the execution code is and so on the execution point is and the key is the debugger inside here the, the comments of the debugger are here at the top step over step into step out stop and and run again um okay so this is the basics um for, for running okay now we can we can play uh, with the code and uh, uh, we see that uh, we can change the value of a as they would say let a e equal to five and c console.log a again if we rerun the project Okay, let's go, let's remove the breakpoint. Uh, uh, where are we, sorry. Run. What happened here? Ah, I'm caught from not debugger available. What are you trying to tell me? Ah, okay, sorry um let is only done once okay so i declare the variable once and then i can modify it i cannot redefine the same variables of course it's already defined so when you run it it will print the first value and then the second value abc and then five and so on um, i have the program output and the bugger output and the independent console so it takes a while uh, to master but uh, and it doesn't create any problem hmm? he, uh, as i mentioned if we go to the javascript tutor web page i can write the same code i can write uh, a equal to abc and we see that a is just a, a, a variable um declared here i can change the value of a to something else and in, while i execute i execute the code go sorry that you see that if i execute the code one line at a time initially i have a set to abc and then a is set to five it looks like uh, uh, we change the value of a but actually it's more complex uh, because if you say do something like um, let's uh, like this is i think it's clear i can create uh, so it doesn't show how i want it because actually i wanted the a and b to point to the same string sorry okay okay sorry i i, I it didn't come out as expected um the idea is that uh, abc and uh, five are different objects uh, in the heap 
and uh, I can refer to these objects by different uh, variables. Okay, we we'll see more in more complex example that will be uh, more uh, evident. So the this, we don't have a value which is contained into an array, a variable. It, the value is being pointed or referred by the variable. Okay, and it will change the way we think about our programs. Uh, what is the difference between, for example, let and const? Or if I try to declare a variable as, as a constant, uh, of course, I will not be able to change it. If I try to compile it, it will give me an error assignment to constant variable here. And so uh, it will be impossible here to change the value of a variable that was declared as a, as a constant. So I can prevent it. Uh, I cannot use a variable in, in strict mode. I cannot use a variable if, as, if it's not been declared. So if I write here b equal to five to six or b equal to a plus one, I try to run it. Of course, it should not be a cost, it should be a normal variable because I'm changing it. I, if I try to run it, uh, I get an error b is not defined here because I'm trying to here assign a variable which has not been defined. So the first time you use a variable, you have to declare it with let. This prevents you from uh, mistyping a variable and by mistake creating a new one and taking two hours to find that your was just a typing error and not a program error. Okay. Um, so if you create this variable here, you can create variables everywhere in the code. Of course, it will work. Okay. It doesn't print, but it works. Uh, it can be a bit boring or, or tedious to uh, save and run and save and run to test the code. And that's why Node also has an, inter an interactive mode of execution. Um, let's throw a Node. And it will enter an interactive mode. When I can write instruction, let A equal to 10. Uh, let uh, b equal to a plus one, for example. And then I can just type the name of a variable to print it automatically. Hmm? So it's, it's an interactive mode when I can go try try some syntax, try to modify something. If I define a constant uh, c equal to a plus b, for example, I can see c. Uh, uh, it undefined here is the value returned by const by let. Of course, const and let doesn't don't return any value. If I write an expression, it will tell me the value for this expression and so on. So I can also try in a more interactive way, especially when I when I learning uh, the different uh, instruction. Uh, if we try to make bit pointer declare there's content and adding, for example, one, we get an error. Uh, maybe to, uh, for example, so let me start node. What are you saying, Andrea? Uh, to a declare, oh, so declare a as a constant. Const a equal to five. Okay. Then we coin we define b equal to a plus one. Right, and then we may uh, you want to change b. It's not a problem. B is six, and I can change b to seven. Uh, it's not a problem. If I want to draw it, uh, let me uh, open the annotations for a moment. Uh, what we are doing here is that we have um, a variable called a that points to a value called five. This arrow is fixed, this is constant. I cannot change A, okay? Then I create B that computes five plus one and creates a new box six. And we make B point to that. But B is not constant, so this arrow can change. When I change it, I will make it point to seven. And so this arrow will be changed there, and it's not a problem. The problem is that if you declare a const, once you set the arrow, you cannot change it uh, later. But the value can be reused, and uh, but you are not modifying this file. It's not possible to modify this value there, of course. Hmm? 
Uh, Alessio is sharing some code. Uh, I is uh, B equal to B where? So B equal to A, then pointed by A and B. If we uh, point the respective by, yes, yes. Uh, we must be aware of uh, the difference between modifying a variable and modifying an object. But since we only know about numbers, uh, uh, we cannot appreciate that. Uh, when we talk about uh, objects, we'll do this, uh, uh, so this difference uh, uh, much more closely. Um, we didn't uh, mention var up to now. Hmm? Uh, var is different. Uh, is different. Uh, um, yeah, but, um, yeah. A table that compares the different versions here. Okay. Um, let and const are the easiest one, and what they can as they declare a new variable. The only constraint is that const in const you cannot reassign the value once you have created it. Okay. The scope of let and const is uh, the block in which they are declared. Quite normal. Like here, you are uh, you are do you are used in Java or in C when you declare a variable inside a block, the variable the, that variable is only visible inside that specific block. That specific block of uh, of braces, right? Var is similar to let because it doesn't it may let you reassign the value the values. But there's a couple of strange uh, uh, behaviors. You can redeclare the same variable. So you can write var a and later on var a again. And just the second one is silently ignored. While if you try to let and then let again the same variable, you get an error, as we saw. Uh, so you can do that. There's no advantage in doing that uh, other than sloppiness. Uh, but uh, a variable declared with var doesn't live only inside its block, but it will live through the whole function in which it is defined. And furthermore, so even if I close the brace, the variable will sti still be alive, which is a bit of dangerous. But strangely enough, it will be available also before you declare it. Even at the beginning of the function, or if there is no function at the beginning of the file. It's very strange. This mechanism is called hoisting, means pulling up at the beginning. I, I show an example right now. When we see the example, I, we will learn to probably avoid var because it's strange. It was the, the old way where the block level scoping was not defined yet. And so there was, there was a function level scoping. So all the variables that you declared inside the function were actually pushed automatically at the beginning of the function, and they were valid for all the function lifetime. But uh, it was not so clean like, like the other mechanisms. There was also a method of just using a variable without declaring it, uh, x equal to three. We know var, no let, and whatever. But fortunately, in strict mode, this is forbidden. So we cannot do it anymore. Uh, Yes, Vincenzo, this is what's happening. So with the uh, let and constant C, it's not a problem. Like uh, if I try to redeclare a variable A that already has been declared, I get an error. A has, has already been declared. But if I create a new scope inside the new scope, I can redeclare a variable, a new variable, which is different from that one. Of course, this is the A in the, the outer scope and this is the A in the inner scope. We will try not to no, do that because having the same name in two different scopes, just a source of confusion for us. But it's legal. You can do that. Let and const variables are scoped in the block in which they appear. Var is different. So we have some code here, uh, which is quite curious. Uh, so. We, have, we are declaring a variable a to one here at the beginning. Let's follow the yellow, OK? Let a equal to one. We are logging, we are printing the value of a. Of course, it will be one. Hmm? Uh, 
uh, okay, we are not touching A, so everything goes right. So the yellow is quite easy. We are assigning a variable, we are printing it once, we are not touching here in the middle, so it's still one. Let's follow the uh, green. The green variable is B. B at this point has not been defined. And so in fact, if we, if we try this statement, we will get an error. B is not defined. Fair enough. We are trying to use a variable where that is not defined. I can define it here, but if I define it inside the block, it will not be available again after the block is finished. So B here, even if lexically comes after its declaration, it is outside the block. And so the variable is not defined. The life of B starts here at the left and ends here at the brace. The same scoping rule that we are familiar with in C and in Java. Nothing strange. Let behaves consistently. Var is a bit strange. If I'm declaring a variable var anywhere inside the function, this declaration, this part of the declaration, is also hoisted at the top, pulled up at the top of the function. So implicitly, it's as we wrote var c at this point. We declare the variable, but we don't assign a value. So if I try to print the variable c, it will get the special value called undefined, which is not null, it's something different. It means uh, the variable is there, but it doesn't point to anything. Hmm. Um, and of course, uh, later on in the code, when I see this statement, c will be changed, and here it will get the new value. In this case, it's two. Okay, so there is a, 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 an interval here, from here to here, where, where the variable is ex exists, but is not defined yet. It doesn't have a value yet. And this creates the need for this special type undefined to track this type of values. A, a variable we declare with let is never undefined unless we write undefined by ourselves, okay? So it's quite strange. It works, but... Uh, it can be unexpected sometimes because you, you don't get any syntax error here at, the, at this point you just get a, some undefined value um lorenzo yes uh, all, in this case we are inside the function so all of these variables uh, are scoped inside the function so outside this function you cannot use them right why the second course of the list is still not defined uh, in the second one is not is no longer defined B was created here. I could have printed here, 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 but in this closing brace, destroys all the local variables that were defined inside this scope. Okay, and so outside this closing brace, B disappears. Hmm. Um, it just um, what I've created a const inside the if statement. You are creating a new variable. The const creates a variable. The, the, the only thing that const does is that it prevents you further reassignments or change of that variable. But from the scoping rule, it behaves exactly like let. Hmm? Yes, it dies uh, after the statement. You see that uh, let and const from this table are exactly identical, except for this reassignment uh, that becomes impossible with the constant. Okay, a lot of uh, you know experienced programmers suggest you to try to get into the habit of declaring always the variable with const, and then change it with to let if you realize that you need to change it. But it's the most conservative uh, possibility. But const or less are usually the the way to go. Okay, we need to be aware of what, what var does, uh, but uh, usually we, we try to avoid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, apart from these strange behaviors of variables, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of operators that can operate on these values, uh, but um, we don't have to lose a lot of time here. We have the normal uh, operators for uh, assignments, uh, 
uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, all the arithmetics that you are, um, uh, all the arithmetics that we are accustomed to have in C and Java, so nothing new here. Uh, there are comparison operators, uh, equal and different, and then we have this strange super equal that is different or strict equal which is different in a way from the equal uh, with the double uh, equal uh, um, statement. So this is a bit strange. Uh, we have two different uh, equality operators in Java, in JavaScript. The difference is that uh, the, the triple equal actually checks uh, whether the two values are of the same type and the same value. Are, I have the same value and of the same type, which is usually what we want. The normal equal only check if they are equal in value and tries to convert the type, the types. Converting the type or reconstructing the types is something that JavaScript does normally. Uh, it does something strange. For example, if I, I take the console and I write three plus, plus two, of course I get five. If I get, uh, uh, if I uh, make a plus b as a string, I get a b. If I write a plus five, you would expect an error. Actually, in, you get a five. I'm adding a string and a number and a number. What does it mean? Nothing. You cannot add a string as an, and a number. So JavaScript will try to convert the number into a string and then try to apply the operation again. This is normal. The normal behavior of JavaScript is trying to reconcile the types or the operands before applying the, oper the operand itself, before you compute the, the operation. Okay. And it was also with the equal. So if I make a, a three as a string, sorry, and I asking myself if, if it's equal to a three as a number, will it tell me yes. Because it first tries to reconcile the types of the, the values and then do the comparison. If I don't want to do that, I use the triple equal and say compare the values without doing that trying the um, type reconciliation step that you are used to. Okay, so this is the only case in which it's important to make the distinction, the, the equality operator. Normally, uh, yes, Sebastian, hmm? three plus two, like you write in the chat, in the chat is, a, or the, or plus two is 32, as a string, is a string composed of characters Characters three and two. It's strange, and we we need to be we need to be careful. Okay. Um, and we will try to. You know, there's a lot of tricks uh, in JavaScript uh, that people try to be clever clever of uh, that deal with the types. Uh, my suggestion is let's try to avoid this, this situation. Uh, the language tries to play the tricks with the types, uh, but we should know what is the type of the variables, or we should not mix uh, different types in our code. Otherwise, I think it's a problem with, our, with, with the robustness of our code, not just uh, with the compiler. Um, so we can, you can do both uh, comparison depending on the case. Mm -hmm. But your, I try to think the default comparison mechanism is the triple equal. If I want to have a comparison with type conversion, I can use the double equal. So normally in your mind, you should start with this. And when you choose, you drop one equal, but you do that, uh, you know, explicitly, you know what you are doing. Hmm? Um, uh, with, with, uh, when you are doing with, with objects, uh, things become more complex, of course. Uh, uh, like you remember in Java, you have the equals method to compare the actual value of objects uh, and the same more or less goes with the JavaScript. Uh, so you cannot expect uh, JavaScript to compare the internal structure of objects. They only compare equal if it is the same object uh, 
and not if they are identical objects. We don't know objects here today yet, so we, we cannot uh, comment further. But it's uh, what, what remains in our mind is that the comparison is done with the reference to an object. If the values are primitive, they are compared. If the values are objects, uh, only the references are the pointers basically are compared and not the copy. You see that A and B are objects that, that have the, the identical structure, but they compare false in both cases because it, the equal doesn't do the work of, of checking the internal structure of, a, of, the, of an object or an array and so on. Um, and so uh, in this operator in this um, type mangling system, uh, JavaScript tries to do automatically as many type conversions as it can to make the expression compile. So there was at the time uh, the idea of trying to be um, forgiving of programmer errors. Oh, so if you, you forgot to convert from number to string, I will do it for you. Okay. And of course, it caused many programming errors because it's, it was hiding some real errors. But uh, it was uh, the, the style of development of JavaScript for many years. And so there was a lot uh, of uh, explicit or implicit conversion of types. And here in this uh, table, I, um, I try to summarize uh, the, the explicit conversions. If I really want to convert something into a string, I can call the string method, something into a number, I can call the number method or just plus, put a plus uh, on top of it, uh, which, which is strange. Uh, but if you have a, a string like uh, let uh, uh, s equal to one, two, three is a string. So s is a string. If I write plus s, it's a number because the Anary plus, the plus with only one operator, cannot apply to, to strings. It can only apply to numbers. So Travis, JavaScript first tries to convert it to a number, if it can. Hmm. Uh, so uh, there are different ways. Uh, for example, uh, you are asking if you can convert explicitly from a string to an integer. Yes, you see that there are at least five different ways to convert from a string to a number. Parsint, pass float, plus and number. And uh, so there are different ways. They have different uh, special cases or corner cases, but you can do all the explicit conversions that you want, okay, with this table. Uh, so it's better to be, to be explicit. I am a sort of a Python man more than JavaScript, so better explicit than implicit. Okay, other operator, the logical ones. Uh, they are used in logical operations, but they are used a lot in uh, um, shortcut computations. Mm. Basically, it will say um, if you have an end, an, um, end operator, Boolean end, it, it will return either expression, the first or the second one, depending on whether it's true or false. So it's a way of saying if expression one is true, return expression two, otherwise return expression one. So it's a way of giving you expression two or giving you nothing. We will see, we'll use this concept a lot on React, but they will be in six or seven weeks from today. Just remember that they have very powerful type of mangling in this case. Um, okay. We have a lot of... Uh, the mathematical functions, nothing, nothing strange. Okay, uh, if we don't want to play strange tricks, uh, it's uh, quite uh, normal. Also, the control structures of the language, I'm going quite fast because there's nothing new here, are uh, the same as we are accustomed from C or from Java. We have the ETH, we have the switch, uh, and so on. Um, the, the case uh, with the for, the do, the while, like in C, basically. You can use the break and continue into the loops and so on. There's only a strange note here that they write, uh, they wrote the condition is truthy. What does it mean? Let's go back to one slide that we skipped before. Where is that? Yeah. This slide's about Boolean numbers. Uh, we are used to for booleans to be in C, they are zero or one, or zero and different by zero. In Java, they are true or false. In Python, they are true or false. In JavaScript, 
anything can be a Boolean or can be interpreted as a Boolean. So the Boolean type has two specific constants, literal constant that are called true and false, right? These are the true, the real Boolean. Then every value in JavaScript can be converted to a Boolean. And the rules are quite strange. If the value is zero or not a number, which is a special number that comes from division by zero, for example, undefined, null or the empty string all of these values are converted to false we call them falsy values all these ones zero not a number and define the null and, and the empty string five of them every other value in, in javascript is truth truthy uh, is converted to true so for example the empty array is true and the empty string is false. Don't blame me, is the language. Okay? A string with, with any character is true. An, an empty object is true. An empty string is false. I, did, I don't make the rules. Okay? These are the rules. So if you have a value which you are not sure what it is, uh, uh, just be aware of these strange, uh, um, strange comparison rules. Okay, everything that is not, there are only basically six false values in JavaScript. Everything else is true. The real false and these five guys. Zero, empty string, undefined null and not a number. Plus, the false constant. Only six values are false in the whole Java, in any JavaScript program. Everything else is true. So beware if you're getting a string or if you're getting an array, um, be careful when you compare it with an if or with a while and so on. Uh, the logic is, big, is historical, basically. Hmm? JavaScript is a language that was created in a rush and then grew very much in the first years. <laughs> And the consi internal consistency was not always the priority. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. And now uh, some choices cannot be changed anymore, of course. So we need to learn some strange behaviors. Mm -hmm. This is why some people hate JavaScript, because it has a lot of corner cases like that, special cases like that. We that they don't have any real motivation. And uh, but we are free to avoid them. Okay. We, we must be aware, but we are not forced to, to, to use them or every day, okay? Okay, uh, so control vectors are very easy. Uh, usually uh, the four is the C-like syntax, and uh, usually the initial expression tries to uh, initialize the index, so let i equal to zero, for example. So we include a let that injects the variable in the scope of the, of the, of the, the expression. Uh, or it reuses a variable that was already defined, but uh, usually we use that. Uh, and there are two special uh, shortcuts for the four statements. Uh, we'll be using uh, them a lot. Um, one is uh, the most important is uh, the for of. So if you if we have uh, an object, a composite object basically, that can be an array, for example or a string basically or others i can iterate over the argument of the elements of this array or, or of the strings one by one using a, a for variable of string or of array at every iteration i get one of the elements okay we see the examples here we have a string called high and we iterate over the element of high with the variable a. So at every iteration, a string here is seen as a container of characters. So the first iteration a is h, at the second iteration a is i, and so on. So we are breaking a string into the characters. Or if we have an array, we still didn't uh, study the arrays, but uh, uh, the syntax is quite here, an, an array of two elements, so we can iterate over the elements of the array itself. 
So it's uh, it, we don't have to set an index to zero and then the array uh, array of i. No, no, you don't write. write uh, you don't have to write the, the use explicitly the, the the index. You can use that, but there's a shortcut. So for of there's also for in, which is a bit confusing because it iterates also over an object but over the properties of, a, of an object instead of the elements containing the object so if you have an object with many properties you can extract the properties one by one which is much less useful uh, unfortunately uh, this uh, is, is uh, equal to the what in java is uh, for uh, a semicolon collection no? array in Java, we have the the, um, sorry, the column syntax. In Python, we have the in here. Uh, and so it's confusing because the in in JavaScript is different from the in in Python. In in Python corresponds to of in JavaScript. If, we, if you use more than one language, uh, you will have to make some barriers in, um, uh, in, um, in your mind uh, to avoid confusion um, okay uh, of course uh, these, these examples uh, i i was uh, reading the chat uh, are with constants but if you have a variable that uh, contains an array of they all you know, of course they work uh, also in the same way there are other more advanced uh, iteration methods, but we'll study them when we see the functional methods of our arrays. And so next week, uh, that are powerful method for doing an operation on every element of the array. But for the moment, the over just remember the over special form of the four statements. We have the try catch uh, for uh, handling uh, exceptions. Uh, try some statements and catch the exception it can be thrown by um, uh, um, uh, by a statement inside uh, the try block or a function called by these statements uh, they behave more or less like uh, like they do in java and c++ um, and we come uh, to them to some more complex data structures let's see the the, the, the main points here uh, arrays and strings, basically. Uh, arrays are a primitive type, uh, a composite type, a primitive type in JavaScript. It contains uh, zero or more elements. They are delimited by square brackets. And the elements uh, don't need to be of the same type. So I can create freely an array uh, called A. Uh, so let's maybe close and restart nodes so that we have a fresh environment. We can create uh, an array with uh, uh, my lucky uh, lucky numbers. Uh, they, they, my, my lucky things are the number 13, maybe the number 17. Uh, and then I have a star and, uh, and they have maybe the asterisk, uh, which are and then also, uh, since I'm an engineer, a three uh, pi, uh, three 3.14 pi number is a lucky number for me. So I have uh, an array, I created an array that contains one, two, three, four, five elements of different types. It doesn't matter. The array contains five elements. Each element points to an object that may have a type, an arbitrary, an arbitrary type. Okay, um, an array is a length, so I can use lucky, which is the name of the array, sorry, lucky dot length. It gives me a number, which is the number of elements in the array itself. I can access the individual elements of the array. So my, uh, what is my lucky number, my lucky element uh, number three is the asterisk because the of course the arrays come from from zero if i try to get uh, the sixth uh, i get undefined because it's uh, outside the the array uh, and what i can do i can modify the elements of the array or i can create a new array with some uh, transformation so what are the basic functions that you can do with the arrays so it's very very simple because it's part of the language 
I create an empty array. I create an array with some elements or of the same type or different types. I can also create an array with uh, some constructor methods like array.of, which is equivalent to this one, basically. Um, so there are two equivalent way using array of or just using the square brackets uh, to create uh, an array. So we will create a new variable that will point to a new array. Uh, there is no negative indexing here, no. Uh, the elements uh, should, uh, the indexes should be from zero to length minus one. Uh, how can you create the new elements? Uh, you can use the push method. You can push a new element at the end. Hmm? What uh, in Java is called add and in Python used uh, is called append. Here is called push, just to have more confusion. Or you can add something at the beginning of the array, so before the first element. And in this case, the method the method is called unshift. Hmm? Uh, this picture will help us remember. So if you want to add something at the end, you push at the end. Or you can pop if you want to extract, delete an element at the end of the array. If you want to insert something at the beginning of the array, you unshift. And if you're going to get out something to extract, to delete the first element, you shift the array. Hmm? Uh, again, don't ask me why they chose this strange convention, which is totally asymmetric, but uh, here it is. Okay. Uh, I think the most the most useful one is push uh, for adding at the end. But you see that depending on how you use these four methods, uh, you can also implement very easily FIFO or LIFO queues uh, because uh, you can uh, if you use a push and pop, you have a five uh, LIFO a stack. If you use a push and shift, you have a, you have a FIFO. You insert at the end, you extract at the beginning, or vice versa. Hmm? So. Uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic structure that can be used as an array, as a static array, or as a list of elements that uh, uh, can grow and change. Um, and of course, uh, it can be it can be copied. And uh, uh, again, uh, the copy here is by reference. Um, if you uh, if imagine you are creating an array. Sorry. With uh, uh, with these two elements, a and a, a and eight. Sorry. And we copy v into another variable. So we create another variable that points to the same array. It looks like a copy. And we change one value, the second element. So basically, we have uh, v, which is an array that contains. Uh, uh, a and eight. Okay. In this instruction, we have the alias A that points also to V. When we do this, we are copying the reference. So when somebody is modifying the second element of the alias, so A, the second element, the alias will be this one. That, by the way, will also belong to V. And so we are also changing the initial value of V. Just remember when you are assigning a structured value, an object, an array, only the reference is copied. So you are creating different aliases, different references to the same object, like with pointers in C or like with references in Java or Python variables. If we want to, if you really want, so you are sharing the same object with different names. If you really want to make a copy of the array, you can use, uh, uh, for example, the method from that will make a copy. Hmm? It copies, uh, it makes, it doesn't make the same reference to the same object. You see that if I make alias equal to V, I have a different variable that points to the same object. If I using this from method, I have a new variable that points to a different array where the elements are being copied there. So we, we start, start thinking uh, about variables that belong uh, to the names uh, 
of our program and the objects that set, that are managed outside in the heap uh, in the group of objects and they are independent from the variables that point to them so in every operation we should always ask ourselves if we are just modifying the variable or if we are modifying the objects and in that case which variables are pointed to that object they will see the modifications okay uh the rule here is quite uh, simple so especially is quite uh, regular so there's no big surprises here hmm? just remember that every variable is just a reference to an object so when you are assigning a variable you are assigning the reference um and of course uh the four of the uh, operator that we mentioned before is working of course on the on the array no uh, on the array that, that we just uh, decided that we just defined um okay i think i can stop here um because we are, i have a, a couple of things more to say about the arrays and then the strings but we can continue on uh, on thursday morning because i don't want to run too much over my time um uh, so there are in, okay, uh, Sebastian is asking if we, we have some exercises. We will do some exercises. So on Thursday, I'll try to uh, finish the topics that we need to finish and do and uh, devote the second hour to do some exercises together. Okay, and uh, we can do them together after we have some some background to work with. Okay, so we have to wait until Thursday if you want. Okay, so if there are further questions, uh, otherwise, uh, I'm sorry, I'm two minutes above uh, over my time. And uh, we can meet again on Thursday morning at 830. I will publish these videos in the next hour or so. Thank you and see you later.